Well, Dias Mirgat is the traditional Irish greeting and it literally translates to God and Mary be with you. So it's not very secular or inclusive, but it is our traditional greeting, so I thought I would let you hear it. Um, I can't sing, unfortunately, and I did consider doing a set from River Dance for you, but <laughs> I don't have the skirt or the tights. And I think that health and safety here might have something to say about it, so you can just imagine it instead. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, while Paul and Bernadine are suffering from um, colds, I'm kind of slightly sleep deprived at this day, so my body hasn't really adjusted to being in the Southern Hemisphere, but nonetheless, I'm having a terrific time. And um, today, I'm, I'm taking up this theme of early intervention, which I know is, is um, a, an aspiration of the department here and generally of of most of the services and agencies in Australia generally. But I'm not going to talk about the benefits of early intervention because I'm sure you know all of those. And I'm not going to talk, you know, draw on any empirical evidence of how it um, enhances children's development. What I am going to do is move on beyond that, actually, and, um, and, to, and to try and look at what it would look like on the ground. Uh, as my, my friend, um, Professor Andy Pithouse from the University of Cardiff says, um, early intervention is a concept that has few known enemies. So I think we can just take that for granted and move on. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to slightly problematize the notion of early intervention and, and look at some of the, the wicked issues that, that sometimes impede its progress. One of the things I was asked to do in coming here to Australia was to give um, a lecture in the University of Melbourne the other night as part of their 80th anniversary series. And what they had wanted me to do was look at the development of child and family social work over the last few decades. And looking at our own history of child protection, um, there's a, there was a, a task force set up in 1975, just 40 years ago, that looked at the system in place at the time and laid the blueprint for our future legislation. And one of its findings was that social workers in child and family services tended to work largely in institutional settings with children who had already been uh, removed from their parents' care by the state. And it suggested a switch to a more community-based focus with the use of what were, it's a rather old-fashioned term of what was described as home helps. To, to enable families to um, improve their parenting. So it's clearly not a new idea, um, and it's clearly very difficult to implement, because if everybody wants it so much, uh, it's sort of, we may ask a question as to why it isn't happening. Now, I'm going to refer to a program that we have operating in Ireland, and I'll just give you a tiny bit of context. Um, in Ireland, we have a dedicated minister for children. We have a dedicated department for children and youth affairs. And we have a standalone child protection agency called the Child and Family Agency. Now, these are relatively new developments. It's all happened really since in the last four years since the current government came into office. And um, one of the initiatives that they are trying very hard to implement is a program known as the PPFS or the Participation Partnership, sorry, Prevention Partnership and Family Support. Um, it's um, and one of its key ingredients, the one that the that is being pushed very very strongly, is a process called a mehel. Uh, and mehel is an Irish word for cooperative, and it really came from uh, days when when villages used to work together to say bring in the harvest or build a barn or something like that. And it's been adapted now to apply to child protection and welfare to form a team around the child, a concept that I'm sure you're very familiar with. But, you know, it's, uh, some, of us, uh, some of us more cynical ones would wish that they would actually just <laughs> put, put Mehel in context with all of the other um, initiatives that they're trying to propose because a Mehel requires the consent of everybody, particularly the parents of the child who is at the centre of concern, to participate. And many of you know that that's not something that you can easily take for granted. And, in fact, Mehels only occur in about 10% of the cases that, that actually come to attention. 
but it's a, it's a very nice idea. And I suppose that brings me along to look at these principles. And I'm not going to go through them in detail because you've seen them all before. These are very ubiquitous, universal, underlying, underpinning principles of any early intervention program. And they all, contain, they all say all the right things. They're very worthy. And uh, I'm sure you wouldn't argue with any of them. And essentially, what, they, what you could summarize them is that um, they want to put the child at the center. They want to work in an inclusive and participatory manner. They want to use evidence-based interventions. And they want to focus on outcomes. And to sum it all up, you could say, so far, so motherhood and apple pie. It's lovely. It's really lovely, and nobody would argue with anything in it. But, but, um, but if, it's so, if it's so obvious that this is what we should do, how come in Ireland we haven't been able to do it over the past 40 years? And in Australia, I don't know how long you've been trying to get your services developed, but you know, why, why haven't we been able to do it? Why are our child protection services inundated with reports? Why have we such a huge fallout rate? Why have we such a high rate of children in care? So anyway. I know I sound very cranky, but I will move on to be more positive in a while. Um, so I'm just going to look at some of the concepts, because I suppose I get irritated, and a lot of my colleagues get irritated, at the type of language that's often used to describe early intervention. You know, my main focus of work has been child protection, and I understand all of those terms very well. I know exactly what they mean. But early intervention is always described in very high-level principles that really don't translate very easily because they're, they, if when you think about operationalizing them, there are so many gaps on the ground that it becomes almost self-defeating. So I'm just going to have a look at some of those. Um, because it lacks specificity, and it's always portrayed in that language, it can come across as one of my academic colleagues, John Pinkerton from Queen's, describes as warm and fuzzy. Um, it's not necessarily... Um, it, it, it doesn't fit into a legal structure. It doesn't put it fit into a policy structure. It, um, it, it just lacks clarity. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we turn it into the same the sort of standard business processes that operate in child protection, because I know a lot of people find those difficult. But a little more uh, understanding of how it may operate on the ground would be very useful. Its multifarious nature is very difficult to convey, actually. And uh, while the positive side of that is it does reflect its connection with the community, and the community isn't always very straightforward and predictable and it doesn't fit necessarily into boxes. But what can happen here really is that it may not be valued properly. And its invisibility makes it politically vulnerable. It's quite easy to sweep it away in times of pressure. Now, most programs aspire to be universalist, that is, to give everybody a good start in life, to give every child a good start. And that, again, is very worthy. And so very many of our universalist provisions, our health provisions, certainly in Ireland, we're lucky because we have very good early years health services. But um, when it comes to early intervention, dealing with families with, that are vulnerable and with difficulties, um, there could be a degree of moral hazard. Now, moral hazard is often used, certainly in our country, it's used to, um, in relation to uh, debt forgiveness. You know, if you, you know, it's a question of should everybody actually be treated the same because that might um, actually in, of ultimately mean inequality for people who need it more. And I suppose my question about giving universalist early intervention services is that um, you are, in fact, diverting resources from high-risk families to low-risk families that may not need them as much. And the question could also be uh, raised about the quality of services if they're spread very thin on the ground. And in fact, Andy Kitt, as who I've quoted already, has, has, uh, has written about this, um, arguing that, in fact, high-risk families do worse in, in early intervention if the quality of the service is poor and if they are spread too thinly. So it's just another question to think about. Um, then moving on to look at targeted programs. Now, this very much depends on the model of early intervention that's going to be rolled out. And I suppose I'm thinking about it from the perspective of a department that's thinking about a national or, or, or community-wide 
approach to early intervention and thinks about um, programmes that have been um, evaluated and, and, and are um, rated very highly. But even when you think of parenting support, it's a, it's a term that is um, it's very commonly sort of associated with early year services. And we have very many early year programmes, you know, Triple P, Magical Years, um, Child Nurse Partnership, that you've all heard of, that are very highly rated, that are considered to be very effective, and I've no doubt they are. But there can be a, two sort of risks attached to these. One is they do focus very much on early years, and they don't actually acknowledge the fact that a number of problems only emerge at different stages during the life cycle, which may be developmentally related, but actually emerge later. Certainly in Ireland, a third to a half of the referrals made to the child protection and welfare system concern adolescents whose behaviour is causing a lot of problems, sometimes um, unfortunately involving a lot of self-harm. And they... they, they early intervention needs to take account of the sort of programs that are going to be acceptable to people in those sort of situations. Um, these, I suppose the, the other issue about evidence-based programs is that uh, not all the programs that are existing currently are evidence-based. Sometimes they're too small. They're what you might call homegrown, organic, very close to the community, slightly informal. Their size, their scale, or just their very nature mightn't lend itself to um, trials. And, you know, it, it is worrying if you hear, like in the UK, where the proponents of early intervention are really saying that, you know, money will only be available where programmes have been subject to random controlled trials, because this could exclude a lot of very valuable work. There are a couple of other concerning issues about that as well, and, and one is that because some programmes that have been running already have not been evaluated, they may be swept away in the new broom of reform, and that would be a big deficit. And then the other is one that um, some of you may be concerned about, and that is that there is a need to for there is a need for agencies and for governments to have a full picture of what's happening in the community and therefore to have a handle, if you like, on all of the services that are available to see that they're providing value for money. But um, it may involve restructuring or reformulating the work that's actually carried out by those agencies who heretofore might have had a very informal image and status, might be perceived as friendly by members of the community, and then their association with a larger programme might actually interfere with that. For example, I was doing research a few years ago on service users, and I was interviewing a service user in a family support centre. It was a community-based family support centre in a housing estate in a relatively deprived area. And the purpose of placing the service there was that it would be accessible and sort of embedded in the community. And I asked her how she liked living in the area, and she said, oh, well, it was all right until this lot got here. And I asked her what she meant by that. She said, people can't walk past this house without feeling that somebody's going to reach out and pull their child away from them. So it's not necessarily the case that uh, informal or family support services are viewed any differently by service users. It's a point that I will um, develop in a minute. Okay, interagency cooperation. Now, I've been around for a long, long time, and I did my PhD 20 years ago, and one of the topics that I looked at then was interagency cooperation. And I read a lot about it, and I was very impressed with research that was done by, in the UK, as part of their package of research in the early 90s following the Cleveland crisis, where they were really trying to look at how to improve the child protection system. And Christine Hallett and Elizabeth Birchall did a study on interagency collaboration, which still holds very, very, it's very, very relevant still to this day. And they described collaboration in terms of ascending formality starting with cooperation at a lower, looser level, based really on friendships and personal relationships and just co-location, moving it up to collaboration and finally to coordination, which is kind of embedded in policy and legislation. But they pointed out that cooperation is dependent largely on the positive attitudes of the parties involved. And they argued that it cannot be assumed that this positive disposition will unilaterally prevail. 
So all of you who are in practice know that there are many reasons for conflict between services, both implicit and explicit, and these include legacies of negative experiences, conflicting aims, mistrust, poor communication. I'm sure this sounds very familiar to you. Fears of negative consequences and so on. For example, the program that's being rolled out in Ireland is really very much based on networks, interprofessional and multiprofessional networks in the community. But there are some professionals like nurses and teachers that are very nervous about what they may, they perceive themselves maybe being dumped with, without the support of the other agencies. So it still is a very um, pertinent issue. And even when multi-agency intervention is achieved, it's quite difficult to sustain. History would say that at the beginning of something, the beginning of an individual project, the beginning of working with an individual family, there's a great momentum, but that peters out as communication kind of, I suppose, it dilutes. Moving on to families, um, David Howe, who's a, a UK academic, coined a great term, I thought, um, in relation to families and child protection, by calling families the jokers in the pack. And what he meant was a lot of child protection policies, procedures and guidelines make the assumption that families are like empty vessels, passive agents, that they're waiting for services to come along and, and tell them what's wrong with them and that they will believe them and immediately be motivated to work with them. So I suppose the truth is that we know that families are not always insightful about their own difficulties. They're not always ready to engage with programs. They're very issues that are causing them difficulty can get in the way of their engagement. Um, their lifestyles are not necessarily orderly. They may not get out of bed to let the home help or the family support worker in. They may not be at home when the community mother calls. They may not be able to bring their children to centres. Um, they may miss appointments. Likewise, young people who would be um, a considerable proportion of the service users that will come to the attention of our services are very difficult to engage. Any of you working in youth services know that. That young people don't want the stigma of attending clinical services. They do want the help. Um, they want to be listened to, but they want to be treated with a huge amount of respect for their own situations. They want their services to be cool, I guess. Um, I did some research with children in nearly 10 years ago now, children who've been impacted by domestic violence, and we interviewed children and young people from 8 to 23. And the older age group were very articulate, really, because I suppose at that point they felt they had nothing left to lose, and they were looking back on some of their experiences. And they talked about how they were bullied in school, how they were isolated in the community because of their parents and the reputation that their parents had, and how they would have loved somebody to talk to, but how they would have hated to go to a counsellor, and how they'd have hated anybody to single them out in school. So what they really wanted was something like a youth service that was something everybody could go to with a confidential sort of pathway to somebody that could hear them and listen to them and help them. So it's really important that um, that, that sort of thing is recognised. But also, I guess, there needs to be recognition that some families do need more work put into engaging them. And what I would maybe describe as a little conditional persuasion might have to be applied at times. And it's something that really needs to be acknowledged. And it certainly doesn't appear in, um, in those principles that I've outlined. Even the term participation, uh, I'm on the expert advisor group for this project and I drive them mad writing to them saying, could you just tell me exactly what you mean by participation? Are you talking about people coming to services? Are you talking about people being on the boards? Are you talking about them working, employed, volunteers? What? Because it doesn't really explain itself. And it does imply a level of involvement that may be intimidating to some parents. Again, in the service user study research that I've done, my sense that I got from them is what families and service users want from a service is, whether it's a child protection or a child welfare service, they want to be respected. They want services on time. They want the services that they ask for. They would like workers that are friendly, and they'd like people that are nice to them and that are reliable. I mean, that stands to reason. That's what we all want from services that we use. Um, they don't necessarily want to be involved, and there is a danger that uh, um, operationalizing this concept of participation is going to engage families that are more articulate than others, and the less articulate or the less cooperative families, if you like, 
will not be part of that participation. So I think it's a term that needs to be unpacked very carefully. Now you'd be glad to know that having undermined all of what my colleagues at home are trying to do, I'm going to move on now to, to be more positive and to um, try and address some of the obstacles that I've outlined. Um, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to um, one of the areas, one of our local areas at home that's got a bit further than some of the others in implementing the programme and would be regarded as doing it successfully on the basis of some fairly skinny administrative data. But the indications are that their referrals into their child welfare system are <clears throat> being successfully dealt with and the referrals into child protection are, have actually dropped dramatically because of the trust they've been able to build in the community. So, so they are an example uh, for now. They, they're very worried about being seen as a leader in this because they feel there's only one way they can go after you go up, you can only go down. But um, they were very helpful in, in, in giving me ideas about how um, to show that these programs can work. So um, the solutions that they that they, they are operating and the ones that I've also drawn from the literature, they could be summarized in terms of three processes. Relationship building, um, which really echoes on what Paul and Bernadine have been talking about, clarity of purpose and strong government governance. So, um, I've, I've got great feedback in Melbourne when I use this term, reticulist. Um, is, as, as some people were able to recognise, it comes from agriculture again. I'm, obviously, I, I have an agricultural background somewhere up there. Um, and I think reticulist was um, a reticulator or something that's, that spread seeds around or something. But um, you'd find this term in some um, management, some of the management literature. And what a, it actually means is, is a bringing together. But, the observations that have been made about multi-agency or multidisciplinary working are amongst the following. The fixation at the intra-organizational domain level understates and neglects the pivotal contribution of individual actors in the collaboration process. And a reticulist can be described as a boundary spanner or a skilled convener. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I've, I've met many reticulists since I came to Australia this time at both at the conference and and even last night um, and I know that um, that it's it's it is a skill that is shared by many people but whether it's actually valued in terms of appointing coordinators to programs or not I'm not sure um, a reticulist will have particular attributes and they will include appreciating the potential for mutual exchange joint participation networking political skills and diplomacy. A simpler description might be a champion. I'm sure that's a term that you use a lot. Um, building the capacity to develop a multi-agency delivery system. A reticulist would be someone who can bring individuals and agencies together regardless of past differences and inculcate a sense of shared values. They will ideally possess the appropriate qualifications and hold a position of reasonable authority in the organization, but should be selected on the basis of their skills rather than their seniority. It's suggested that they might not be located at the top of the hierarchy, but typically have good access to it. Their position should be that they do not represent a threat to top management, but are tolerated in the expectation that they can deliver solutions to complex problems. Appointment of a reticulist will provide the foundation for relationship development between the different services in the early intervention network. So the first steps really in building these effective relationships are to try and reach the groups in the community that are not that easy to get in a cluster. And for example, in the area that I'm talking about, they felt that the two groups that they needed most to get were teachers and general practitioners, general medical practitioners, uh, because um, in Ireland, I don't know if it's the same here, each school has a board of management, but other than that, they're actually independent. Um, they're not under a local committee, and there isn't an overarching administrative system that can tell schools what to do. They obviously, their relationship is with the Department of Education, which given the number that there's 4,000 schools in Ireland, you know, it's quite a distant relationship. 
So uh, in this area, they identified 120 school principals that they felt that they should try and connect with because there's a bad history of relationships between child protection and social workers in schools. And I'm sure you probably have the same issues. Schools complaining that they make referrals, they tell parents that they refer them, they never hear anything back. Their concerns fall below the threshold, et cetera, et cetera. They don't want to find the time to attend child protection conferences and so on. So what the, um, in, in this instance, it's the intake team leader and the child and family support network coordinator um, strategically managed to find locations where they would get clusters of teachers. For example, the Irish Primary Principals Association hold education events in education centres. So instead of writing to the teachers saying, we're introducing this programme, we're having a meeting, come to us and we'll tell you what to do, what they did is they went to the teachers, they asked for time at, the, you know, at, at one of their sessions. They started off by acknowledging the hostilities, I mean, they may not have used such a strong term, but maybe the differences and the issues that have arisen between them in the past. They asked them to listen, to hear them out, to hear them out in terms of the programme that they wanted to introduce, and then to have a full and free discussion. At which point, really what they managed to do by the end of the evening was come up with a joint agreement on what they really wanted and what their shared concerns were and what they felt their core shared business was, which was to address the needs of the very vulnerable children that they would see every day in the classroom. So that created a quite an amount of goodwill. Uh, with GPs, they um, piggybacked on some primary care meetings and managed to uh, access the GPs that way, and that was reasonably successful. Unfortunately, um, I don't know if you'd have similar challenges here, but the mental health services proved to be more distant tend to, to revert back into their health role and really weren't that keen, but they are starting to get them on their steering committees and, and that's very helpful. What they have said is that the last thing you do is use a top-down approach. You don't remind people that it's their duty or that it's their responsibility or their legal requirement. What you do is start at the other end with let's have a, let's agree on what we want to achieve by um, implementing this programme. Now, I'm using the term network approach. I, I don't know if that's something that's, that's used very much in, in terms of the way that you do it. But I suppose what we are trying to do, or, and I'm, I'm not really part of it, but what they are trying to do is um, use networks to look at the needs of the community and respond in a proportionate and appropriate way rather than do what the, te the temptation can be if you have what you think is a good service, you fit everybody into that service. So they're not doing it that way. They're trying to um, really go down to where the families are, if you like. And if the problem is the child isn't getting to school, they'll, they'll involve the school. They might involve an education welfare officer, involve possibly a family support worker, but not necessarily involve that child in going to a centre for any other service. So I suppose the, the message there is to try and... Uh, have as many options that are available and in particular I would make a bid to boost up youth services because they are very good at working with children on the edge and they're very good at tolerating situations that other services may be very nervous about. Um, dovetailing I suppose is another term that I would use uh, to try and describe a tricky balance that needs to be reached. Um, you know that a concern is, and I've heard this concern expressed here today, and I've heard it expressed by other people, that families, under a lot of the new reforms that are being operated, particularly in English-speaking countries, families coming to child protection may be diverted away because thresholds are high, diverted and referred into non-governmental support services. But actually, whether they engage with them or not is not always known. Um, and whether, that, whether that's always an appropriate referral isn't actually often questioned because families don't remain the same from week to week. There could be a bereavement. Somebody could move in, somebody could move out, they could become homeless. Some disaster could happen and pitch them right back into the child protection arena. And for that reason, there needs to be that level of flexibility where each sector, if you like, if you like to look at it as two sectors, 
is open and willing and available to respond to the other when the need arises. So it is really important. And that is one of the issues that has caused a lot of difficulty in the past, is that families may be referred into the welfare system, if you like, and can't get back. The welfare staff, if you like, can't get the refer back into the child protection system, or sometimes can't quite articulate what the problem is, but know that their service just simply isn't enough. So that, those kind of connections really must be, must be very strong. And I do know that in Victoria, when I, I, I didn't do any site visits on this trip, but I previously went to a child first hub, and I was impressed by the fact that the statutory agencies team leaders were co-located with the child first workers and I thought that obviously deals addresses that issue very well. Now the third the third issue I was going to look at was governance and oversight and that is um, something that um, again in Victoria the Commons report drew attention to some weaknesses in the child first project which had emerged from the fact that governance wasn't strong enough and there wasn't sufficient oversight to see what everybody's doing. So I suppose you must, in a community or in an area, have the right structures that will give you the transparency that's required to know um, whether these services are working sufficiently. What we have in Ireland is under the Department of for Children, there are a network of children and young person services committees, which are made up of um, lots of different services. They're not necessarily welfare focused or child protection focused. They're about, you know, they could be about children's play, place, play spaces or libraries or, or, or other issues in the, in the county that they operate in. Um, but they're, so that's, if you like, that's the next step down from the department. And then below that, the children's services committees have subcommittees. And the steering group for the PPFS is one of those subcommittees they can draw from other subcommittees that might be on education or might be on youth justice or something else. And so that committee is made up of a steering group and a lot of work, I am told, needs to go into the composition of that steering group and the way the people in that steering group are empowered and minded and um, treated, with, treated equally, if you like, and encouraged to, give, to make their contribution. And below that, again, then, the, the steering group tries to set up networks. And networks are usually based geographically, like in, a, in a, maybe a housing area, a small part of the community. And a network is comprised of um, the relevant personnel from the various services. Hopefully, it will include people from schools, from health, from perhaps domestic violence services, um, mental health services, anything that's relevant to, you know, maybe a drugs task force, anything that's relevant to that particular community. So together then they will try and work between them in, in, in a geographical way with the families that are referred to them. Each network will have a, each steering group is chaired by the coordinator. Each network will have a lead professional so that um, there is always somebody that's coordinating the work that's done and that isn't um, going to let things fall through the cracks. It does sound a little bureaucratic, but it actually fits quite well in with the way that services are delivered anyway, so it's not imposing an extra layer on them. And then the business of uh, tying up loose ends, which I, I think is very important again, given some of the concerns that were expressed. And just to give you a kind of micro example of how this happens on the ground, is that um, If a referral comes in, and we do have a one front door policy, which maybe isn't, it's not what operates everywhere else, it's what was considered to be the most useful. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the best because it does, you can create a kind of an egg timer situation where stuff gets stuck just behind the front door and doesn't get out the other side. But um, in working with that one front door policy, when a, refer a referral or report comes in, the um, duty team leader will log it and then very regularly, in fact they meet every Monday, she meets with the child and family support coordinator and hands over the cases that don't meet the threshold for child protection. And they have said while they always resisted thresholds before and always kicked against the notion that you can have a, a, a threshold that you can apply to everything, she said they are beginning to be very clear about their thresholds and to her surprise they begin to be very comfortable with their thresholds. 
And that's because they have options to deal with the cases that don't actually meet the thresholds for particular actions. So the families, Child and Family Support Coordinator has six staff working with her and she makes sure that every report that is categorised as child welfare gets a contact, sorry, that every family that's reported gets a contact. If the families choose not to engage, that is re-referred back to child protection. There may not be a contact from child protection, but the referral is reviewed again, just in case there is anything that, that, doesn't, that doesn't allow them to comfortably close off the case, essentially. So that's probably the best that they can do, but it does seem to me from what I hear from other places that it does close off loops, it does, you know, it does tie up loose ends and it does mean that um, it's not just bye-bye when you refer a family to, to a family support service. There is some follow-up to see how they're doing. So that's the end of my presentation and I suppose in conclusion, the main message from this presentation has been High-level principles will only come to fruition if the key elements are operationalized at a micro level. You obviously need good principles at the top, but you also need good foundations at the bottom or it will collapse. And when you do have a well-integrated system like that, it can withstand pressure. Because certainly we've had a big retraction. Well, you know we've had a, a long period of austerity in Ireland, as in many other countries. And we had a considerable retraction of our family support services but this recent investment is helping to redress that balance. But because, and you know, all, everybody involved in public health knows this, when governments have prevented something, they can't quantify what they've prevented. They might find it easier, and I'm using the public health analogy, governments find it easier to say, I built a hospital, rather than I actually stopped 2,000 people from having a need to go to a hospital, you know? And, you know, like, like every other country, we've got an election coming up next year. You have all these political sensitivities. And, you know, so our Taoiseach doesn't get, you know, all those high-level principles. He wouldn't be able to talk about um, early intervention, except in a very warm and fuzzy way. What he, would, he, what he would love to be able to talk about is the number of how, how much they've managed the waiting lists in emergency departments. So... Um, so having a well-integrated system that you can actually, in a way, quantify and show and um, operationalize in a simple, easy to engage with way means that there is a more likelihood that if there's a big scandal, that it doesn't totally undermine the early intervention program um, and that it can actually manage to sustain feet on the ground. But finally, I would say there are two things that I didn't refer to in this presentation, and they are very significant, and um, they are very essential. One is the willingness of governments to sufficiently invest. And, and as I've said, really the relative invisibility of prevented child harm means it doesn't compete politically with more visible intervention aspects of child protection policy. But the second factor is, of course, one that, that Paul and Bernadine referred to as well, and it's the need to address the factors that contribute to the vul vulnerability of children and families. I often get frustrated, because my background is social work, that social workers are, are, they're kind of a vessel for all of the ills of society. People want to other all of those things. They want to dispose of problems in a profession like social work, and that's why it gets punished so much. But there is a real need to look at what the problems are. And of course, we know, uh, Paul referred to the tech toxic trio, and I know here in Australia, gambling in some parts of Australia is a big problem as well. Um, so those need to be addressed. And uh, I'm going to quote uh, Robert Dingwall, who's a, a, a British sociologist that did a study about child protection 30 years ago, in fact, nearly longer, about 35 years ago. And um, he theorized that many developed countries operate what he described as a liberal compromise. And this may sound familiar to you. A social climate in which welfare services try to minimize harm but inequality is still allowed to prevail. And that's because the means necessary to deal with inequality would conflict with social and political ideologies around freedom and autonomy and the position of the family, and sometimes with vested economic interests, such as the drinks industry, for example. It's a big conflict in our country. While much has changed since this observation was made, it is necessary for governments to acknowledge that early intervention is only one stratum in a multi-layered system. And unless its foundations are strong, its chances of success are limited. So thank you very much. Um, yes, 
Karen's up the back with the microphone. Um, I was thinking about your slide where you were talking about passive parents of passive sensitive way, and I, I mean, I think that the only way to do it is to create those relationships. But when you've got a statutory responsibility and you're trying to develop trust, that's a very hard ask because basically what you've got is the big stick which says if you don't do what I want you to do, I can take your child away. So I, I guess I'd like to get a sense of how you think that the trust and the regulatory thing can sit together. I mean, we have mandatory reporting in Australia, which means that if you go to someone like your doctor or someone like that and say, help, I need help, then that is likely to invoke child protection. And I think that causes a big problem for people about how do I go, where do I go, everyone will know, I will be picked up by the system. I think that's a brilliant question, um, a very sophisticated um, question. The, how do you reconcile relationships and trust and regulatory functions? state social workers or police officers. I think it's partly about having the right model of practice that will help. So if you were to burn the thing, if you were, bur if you were to burn the uh, statutory child protection services to the ground and start again, you would definitely do it differently. So social workers have only small amounts of time to practice. A lot of their work is tied up in um, recording, reporting, checking, um, being accountable for their, for their work to systems as increasing demands on government, uh, from government come to show us what you're doing, show us your activities, show us you're doing your assessments on time, you've completed your reports, all these things. So if you look around the world, what you see is that social workers are spending small amounts of time with children and families and caregivers, small amounts of time, 10%, 15% of all their time. If you burnt the system to the ground and started again, you'd change that, you'd flip that on its head completely. You'd say, what are the things that make the biggest difference in terms of supporting people to change? And that's when the client has an emotional investment in understanding the nature of the problem, their interpretation of that, and doing something about that. And that comes through conversations, and that comes through relationships, and that means giving people time. And if you have that time, you have the space to talk about the functions you have as a regulator as well as a, a helping caring, professional, trying to help somebody. So I often think that time is a big problem and that the systems we design as social workers to work in, work against them, work against the, the, the ability to form those relationships. And of course, if you're going to spend time on that, you have to stop doing something else, right? So there's not more time, you've got to stop doing something else. We know they already work overtime, we know that. It's very clear in the research. So you've got to take things off them, you've got to take things out of the system. And I think that involves trust from government in the profession to say, we will give you the space and time to do the clinical work or the relational work with people because that's where the difference occurs. So a classic example is caregivers, you see. So what you see social workers do with caregivers is they bypass them or they make decisions about them or they don't engage them in decision making. Or, and the caregivers are the experts on the children much more than the social workers. The bloody social workers hardly ever see the kids. The caregivers are looking after them all the time. And yet they don't involve them in the decision making and the planning for the children. They don't use the skill and the expertise of the caregiver to support and make things work. So, so it seems to me that, that the practice model is wrong and you need to reconstruct it. You actually need to deconstruct it and reconstruct in a different way that creates that space for people. I'll tell you a little story just, just to illustrate the fact. I went to a family group conference once. We were evaluating them. And the whole family were there and everyone was bloody arguing and talking and it was like chaos. They came up with a plan. At the end of it, which was fine. And we asked the social worker and the caregivers what they thought about the social worker. It was terrible. Everyone was talking at the same time. It was a real chaos. It was real messy. And the caregiver said, it was brilliant. Everyone was talking at the same time. And everyone was trying to work things out. <coughs> and they had a completely different perspective of exactly the same phenomena. But the caregivers knew that these families aren't neat, neat and tidy and that, you know, and to sort problems out is a tricky, tricky mess. So I think you've got to change the system, you've got to create space for workers to have those conversations, honest conversations. And then if you're honest with the people you're working with, they can understand your role. But if you're just flying over the top of them all the time and doing things to them, it's never going to work. Did you want to? Yeah, um, I, I thought I, I've, I've followed up and thinking um, about the way that a lot of our systems are going with 
standard business processes and assessment tools and so on. And the, the goal can sometimes be, you know, that the social worker or whoever visits the family and their goal is to complete the assessment. It's sort of, you know, to tick all the boxes and, and to be able to enter it in the computer and move on to the next uh, business process. Whereas um, what is required to do is uh, some motivational interviewing. I mean, that would be the practice tool that, that we would try and encourage practitioners to use. And that is really focusing not on you're a lousy parent, look what you've done as um, what would you like to see happen for your child and let's see what's that stopping that from happening. And ideally you would try and convince that person that, um, you know, th their child needs to attain certain whatever it is, grow more, behave better in school, you know, something like that. And that they will only be able to do that with the assistance of the caregiver. So you kind of work your way, you know, using the wheel of change, you kind of work your way around that. And to tolerate relapse is very important. So that, I mean, this is, you know, it's all about, it is all about relationship building. And as Paul says, if workers are now fixated on, you know, having their relationship with their computer instead of the relationship with the family, that's not really going to work. So, We've kind of thrown out the baby with the bathwater in terms of being able to do that. We've run out of time just about. Just putting the lights on. on. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to say, just in regard to then looking at relationship with Iwi, it, it, it follows through exactly as, as Paul was saying when you're talking about families. Because, in fact, what they wanted to do was to look at the, the earlier intervention. Um, and, you know, in, in past times, it was very much about trying to pull them to, to the statutory end. Um, and, in fact, that, that wasn't the right thing to do. And enabling them to actually determine that for themselves was really important as part of this process. Um, and to have a look and to see what does that mean, because there are different ways of doing this. And, you know, that's about them coming back to each individual marae within their, their region and having a look and to see what are the resources that they have got there that will enable them to keep kids safe. Yes, um, I have to draw this to a close, um, but it's obviously been a really interesting um, discussion about systems and process and knowledge, language. Um, we've covered, you know, full gamut of things today, um, but all with the you know, the intention of sort of looking at what we're actually doing and how we can actually contribute in our own ways too through the national policy agenda and through our local communities. I mean, it all comes back to us to be active local community members as well. So would you join with me in thanking um, Helen, Bernadine and Paul? <laughs>